Uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 11 if you want to turn there, but we're also going to be in Psalms 46 and maybe even a, a little bit in 2 in Second Corinthians. Oh, look, Isaac's even thinking about the things. Um, everybody, everybody can feel it for me, I guess. <clears throat> so, uh, anyway, so here we have in in First Samuel chapter eleven, we got kind of a a situation that's brewing. There's this there's this little little community called Javish Gilead. Anybody familiar with Javish Gilead? If you know, we, Isaac and I were we were talking about it this week, so he remembers. Um, you know, uh, with my with my kids, I've tried to I've tried to to give them the history because one of the things that that I believe about the Scripture is that you cannot understand the New Testament without the without a good fundamental understanding of the Old Testament. Now, the story of Javish Gilead goes all the way back to the Book of Judges. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with it. But what we see coming, coming together, it's almost like two rivers coming together here with Saul and Jabesh Gilead. Because we have seen the tribe of Benjamin and Jabesh Gilead together before. And go back into the book of Judges. I'll just kind of give you the context of what is going on. So there's this guy. He's trapped. He is, he is living there in the times of the Judges. And he's got this concubine. And she runs away. She runs away from the guy. And he decides that he's going to go get her. And he goes and he finds her and spends some time with her dad and family and finally leaves and he's traveling back and he stops at this little town in the tribe of Benjamin. I can't, at this time, I can't remember exactly what that town was called. Uh, but let me see. What, what was it, Isaac? It slipped in my mind. What, what was that little town called that he, that he was at? You remember? Anyway, for a little town in Benjamin. And while he's there that night, this, this older guy invites him into this house. Well, that night, he gets a knock at the door. Several men of the city have come to that older guy's house and said, We want your visitor. We want to know him. And y'all know what the Bible, the Old Testament, when they use that phrase, no, that meant that they wanted to rape this guy. And he's like, don't do this. And this is of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's like, take the concubine. Would you take the concubine? And they give, they give those guys the concubine. And that night, they abuse her and they beat her up. And the next morning, the guy who's traveling goes to the door and he finds his concubine holding on to the door handle dead. That's as far as she made it after... The, after those men had abused her all night long. So the guy, he loads up his concubine, his dead concubine, goes home, and he cuts her up into 12 different pieces and distributes her through the 12 tribes of Israel. And he tells the story about these guys in, in Benjamin that did this vile thing to his, to his, to his concubine. Well, that rouses everybody up, and they contact this city, and they and they say, "Give us the guys who did this," and they wouldn't do it. I don't know who these guys were, but they wouldn't turn them over. And the whole tribe of Benjamin stood up against the other eleven tribes of Israel, and a civil war breaks out. Man, people and and Benjamin, they they're mighty men. It said that they're all left-handed swordsmen and they can all sling a, a, a rock and they're just mighty warriors and they are whipping the rest of Israel's tail. People are dying left and right, but not Benjamin. And the war continues and finally, finally, they make this plan in which they're going to draw out the tribe from this, from this city and they're going to attack Benjamin from the from the back. And when they do, they burn the city. All of a sudden the warriors, they're disheartened, and they start failing. And Israel wipes, just about wipes out the tribe of Benjamin. There's only about 600 of those guys left. 
after, after this civil war has done its bloodshed. Now, those are some of the things that you see in the tribe of Benjamin. It, has anybody ever heard that story before? It's a Bible story. It becomes very important to understand who God really is whenever you start seeing what's happening here in 1 Samuel. So, Benjamin, there's only a few of those guys left, and all of a sudden, everybody's hearts are broken. We've just about wiped out one of the tribes. What are we going to do? So they start talking, and they're like, well, which, which, which city, which community did not support the effort to deal with Benjamin? And it was, a, it was the community of Jabesh Gilead. That's who we're going to talk about today. And they end up going down and fighting against Jabesh Gilead. Kill everybody. Except a few, except a few people. And they take 400 young ladies that, that they, they purposely, they went in, they raided Jabesh Gilead because they didn't fight in the battle. Took 400 young virgins, gave them to the tribe of Benjamin. And then there's a couple, there's still a couple a hundred guys who don't have wives now. So they end up letting those guys raid a dance party that's going on. It's just crazy. And you get to the end of this story, and your mind is like, what did I just read from the Bible? And you see these words. There was no king of, in Israel that during these days, and every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Did that sound like a crazy story? The same thing can happen in the United States when people do those things that are right in their own eyes. But God is not finished. He's not finished with Benjamin. He's not finished with Jabesh Gilead. Because when you get to 1 Samuel chapter 11, all of a sudden, you see this little community who, who had no chance against all the tribes of Israel, and they were almost obliterated. There's not much left of these guys. This is just maybe 100, maybe 150 years later, I guess. And all of a sudden, there's this Nahash, this leader of, of the Ammonites, and guess who he wants to pick on? Jabesh Gilead. And he comes down and says, I'm going to, I want, I, I'm going to conquer you guys. And they're like, well, well, is there anything that we can do? And he's like, well, there is something you can do. You can surrender, but I'm going to take out all your right eyes. I'm going to make you all blind in one eye and humiliate all of Israel. I mean, it looks kind of like the way that things look in our world. It's, if you get somebody who's weak, it's like they just seem to be picked on. You know, I have all those chicken stories, right? You see that in the chicken coop. You get, a, you, get a, you get one chicken that's being picked on by somebody. It's like they all start picking on him. And that's, I feel like that's what's happening to James Gilead. And now they're being picked on. But there's a guy who stands up. We've already been introduced to him. His name is Saul. And he comes in from the field because the messengers have come out. And they're like, Give us seven days to see, will, there, will somebody stand up in our defense? That's what James Gilead is doing. They're looking for somebody. Is there anybody who cares enough to help defend us? And Saul, so, from the tribe of Benjamin, you see how these paths just cross? That God is not done with Benjamin. God is not done with James Gilead. And he uses the least of these things. You know, before Saul, Samuel's talking to Saul and Saul makes this, makes this comment, he's like, why would God care anything about me who's of the least of the tribe that is of the least of Israel? That's what that means. It's because ben, Benjamin has almost been wiped out. They're nothing compared to the rest of the tribes. But God looks upon the weak. And he raises up somebody strong. Makes them strong. And here Saul stands up. And he is upset at the word of Ammon. 
of the Ammonites. And he takes a couple oxen and chops them into 12 pieces. And he sends those out to Israel. And he says, this is what's going to happen to all of your oxen if you do not stand to fight against the Ammonites for the sake of Jabesh Gilead. You see, Jabesh Gilead, man, they, they had just been beat down. And they had just lost all their will to fight. They're like, nobody likes us. Nobody cares for us. The last time something like this happened, we were attacked by our own people. Well, I don't even think Israel likes us. You ever been like that? You're like, man, I don't know if anybody likes me. I don't know if it's worth fighting for. Maybe I should just let Nahash pluck out my eye. That would be easier. That would be better than losing my whole life. And they're considering this and they're like, they just don't have the will to fight. Is there anybody who will stand up for us? And Saul. Saul stands up. And he inspires all of Israel. In fact, the scripture says that they, that Israel gained the fear of the Lord. You know, the first time I read that, I thought it meant that they feared the Lord. But it, that's not what it is. When you have the fear of the Lord inside of you, all of a sudden, you are encouraged. You are emboldened. You become a powerhouse of, 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 a, of, a, of a tabernacle that can be used for God's glory. That's what the fear of the Lord will do in you. Where it doesn't matter what the obstacles are against you in your life, you've got God on your side you know it, and the enemies of yours become the enemies of God. And God doesn't do, God does not like it when somebody messes with his people. I don't like it when somebody messes with my kids. Would you, God does not like it when somebody messes with his kids. He doesn't. And he, had, God didn't, it was not a surprise what was going to happen. And God had prepared a man. He prepared Saul to stand up against the Ammonites. It just so happens that that's exactly what happens. All of Israel comes in. Just hundreds of thousands of these guys. Ammon doesn't stand a chance. And Jabesh Gilead is spared. Isn't it interesting that their story comes back into the purview of of the scripture. Their story is not dead. And I'm not giving you the spoiler yet. You have to wait till the end. Of First Samuel to hear it. Some of you already know it. But if you don't. You just got to keep coming. You, there's more to the story. God is not done with Jabesh Gilead. And this is going to make a tremendous difference. In those young men's life. Now I don't know if Saul got, got so stirred up. Because he was probably related to Jabesh Gilead in some way. Because of one of the tribe, because one of them was probably one of the his mom might have been from that tribe, or grandma might have been from that tribe. We don't know. But as I was starting to think on these things, I started considering Jabesh Gilead, and that they're and that they've kind of lost their will to fight. And I've been there. I've been there. Have you ever been there? Where you just been, it's like, man, the world has beat me down. I feel, I feel like that, that chicken in the, in the hen house that everybody's picking on. I'm just trying to do my thing. And it's like I just keep getting attacked from all different directions. I want to show you something from Psalms chapter 46, if you'll turn there. In Psalms chapter 46, what do you do when you've lost the will to fight. In verse 1 and 46 it says this. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. When you start looking at this verse. I'm just going to break it down a little bit. Refuge means a place of safety from the elements. From dangers or falsehoods. Which could be lies. It's a place of trust and hope. God is our place of safety. He is our source of truth. 
He will protect us from danger. He will protect us from the lies. Because the devil wants to, he's lying to you. When you trust in God, he will protect you from the lies that the devil is trying to throw at you. You see, Jabez Gilead, they have believed the lie. We're of less value than anybody else in Israel. I don't, Israel doesn't really care about us. Nobody really wants us around. They've shown that before. But God is not done with Jabesh Gilead. And this time, people are not doing those things that are right in their own eyes. They're doing things right in God's eyes. And when they do things that are right in God's eyes, you protect the ones that are the weakest among you. Does that make sense? That's why we as believers, we cannot give up the fight. We cannot say, the world's too powerful, we just have to surrender. We've got to stand strong. And there's only one way that you're going to be able to stand strong, and that's if you've got God's strength. You need His strength inside of you. Because if you, if you lose focus, if you lose track of what is really important in this life, you will be defeated. And you'll... And it's not because you, you had to be defeated. You lost the war in your mind already. You've already given in. You need to understand God is your refuge. He is your strength. He is the, he's that material. He's that physical, that mental, that social, that political produces boldness and courage in you. When you have God's strength inside of you, you're going to be bold. You're going to be courageous. You're like, you know what? I can do this. Maybe you have experienced failure. Maybe you've experienced some major problems. What do you do? Does that mean that you can just quit? Did Jabez Gilead quit? Did Benjamin quit? In their minds they had it. But God says, no. I'm bringing these guys back up. They need some major encouragement. And I've prepared somebody to encourage them. That's what God wants to do to you. That's what He wants to do to me. He wants to get you back to where you need to be. He wants to be your help, that aid. He wants to, to there's a word that says to, to succor. It means to assist. And support in times of hardship and distress. Listen, you are not alone in the hard things that you have been dealing with. And I know many of you have been going through very, very hard and difficult things. You're not alone. Life in this world is hard. God told us way back in Genesis... Life would be full of thorns and thistles. The ground that you walk on is cursed. You're going to have hardships. You're going to have problems. But let me tell you, there is a help. And that help is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And He has a fix. He has a repair. What do we do until that repair is done? We have to roll up our sleeves. And we have to press forward towards the mark. The glorious call that he's called us for. Even when things fall apart. Look at verses 2 and 3 in Psalms 46. Therefore will we will not we fear though the earth. Therefore will not we fear though the earth be removed. And though the mountain be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be trembled. Though the mountain shake with the swelling thereof. You see the psalmist he says. Man, there are times when things just seem to fall apart. And I look around and I'm like, oh my goodness. For the past few weeks, it feels like some things have just been falling apart. If you're following the election, it looks like it's a train wreck already happening. Things just look like they're falling apart. The spirit of fear does not win. Do you understand that? They had the spirit of fear. And God is trying, and it's so interesting. Benjamin, they have been, they have been almost annihilated. Saul thinks that he's, he's not, 
He's like, why would God pick me? I'm of the least of the tribes. And we found out in one of the previous chapters, what did God give Saul? His spirit. His spirit. Not the spirit of fear. God is not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And if you, and if you walk in the spirit of God, it doesn't matter what the problems are that you've got in your life. You know God's going to get you through. You know, we get so wrapped up in all the things that's going on in, our, in, in this life. Look, it feels like a big deal right now. But in the whole scheme of, a, of eternity, it's barely even a drop in the bucket. It's, it's not even a drop in the bucket. And we think, oh my goodness, this is the end of the world. I promise you, it's not the end of the world unless you decide, I'm just going to give in to the world. Now, if you give in to the world, it is going to be the end of your world. Because you're not relying on God's strength. You're relying on the strength of this world. And the world has already proven it is a moral failure. Don't be a friend of this world. Because if you're a friend of this world, you're an enemy of God. Forsake the world and say, you know what? I want God instead. And what? And if God's on your side, as the scripture says, if God is for us, who could be against us? And Saul has, under, has come to understand this. God is for them. Same had already told him. He's like, whatever God moves on your heart, Saul, go with it. Because God is with you. How much the same for you when God has filled you with his Holy Spirit? Is not God with you? Don't be afraid. You know, we've seen over the past few years what fear can do to a people. No more be afraid. Don't be afraid anymore. Say, I am harnessing God's power and His will, even though things are falling apart. In verse 4, look at this. It says, There is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Very awesome verse when you start looking at it. <clears throat> there is a river. What is he talking about right here? I think he's talking about like when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. Do you remember that story? There's a woman. She had been through five different guys and the guy that she was living with was not her husband. How do you think her life went every single day? She's out gathering water in the middle of the day. Nobody works in the middle of the day. It's hot. But she, couldn't even, she wasn't even permitted to be around other people. Her life was such a mess. Relationship failure after relationship failure after relationship failure. Five failed marriages. And she's just trying to survive. And all of a sudden, she meets the master, right? And he tells her something. He says, if you drink of this water that you're pulling from the well, you're going to thirst again. But he says, I have something so much better. There's a fountain. It's of living water. It springs up within your soul. It fills you up with everlasting life, not death. When people live in fear, they are it is almost like they are experiencing death every single day. You understand what I'm saying on that? They are mourning. They are going through the mourning process. All of these things, why are these things happening to me? You know, I was talking to Brother Larry the other day. And it's, sometimes it's hard to talk to him because he's hurting so bad. You know, he's, he's got a tremendous amount of pain 
can't breathe very well, can't walk very well. Disease is just eating him alive. Can't hardly speak on the phone, but he tries. And he says, Brother Mitch, this is, I know I'm going through so much, but he's like, this is what I think about. My Savior went through so much more than what I'm going through. And I'm just getting a little piece of that suffering that he had to deal with. I'm like, Larry, that's a good attitude to approach all this with. Man, I don't know how he's doing it. I don't know how he's dealing with all that stuff. When you're going through things, and I don't know how, I mean, I don't know all Larry's past, but I know he's thinking about eternity a lot more. And that's what Jesus says. That well springs up everlasting life. So that you don't, you don't just think, I want to stay in this world. You know that there's a better place. You know there's a, a, a place where there is no more pain. There is no more suffering. There's all, there's healing. All the things that you experience. He's taken, they are taken away. In Revelation 21 and verse 6, listen to this verse. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. Now, if you could think of a more unsuitable candidate for everlasting life, it's probably the woman that's gone through five marriages and is, and is living in adultery right then. But you see, God, God in His knowledge and His mercy and His grace, He looks at somebody like that that the rest of society has rejected and said, you are worth it. You are valued. Maybe the rest of the world doesn't, doesn't see you as worth anything anymore, but God Almighty looks at you as somebody who's made in His image, who is worth saving, who is worth delivering. Benjamin, I'm not done with you. Jabesh Gilead, I have prepared somebody to save you. You just got to keep faith. Don't give in to the spirit of fear. Let the, let the fountain of everlasting life spring up within you. The scripture says here, it makes the waters make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Isn't it interesting? I'm not going to read that whole passage, but if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and read verses through 1 through 8, this is what Paul tells you. You are. God's tabernacle. Isn't that something? All of a sudden we get a tie into the Old Testament. The waters may glad the city of God. That's the place where all the tabernacles of the Most High live. He makes you glad. He makes you glad. Even when you're sad. He makes glad the tabernacles of God. You know why He can make you glad? Because when you get to heaven, you will realize that the things in this world just do not compare to the glory that awaits you. The worst that you can go through in this world is not to be compared to what is awaiting you. It's so much better. You can't even fathom it. They can't make a movie good enough to express what heaven is like. What it's like being around God Almighty. What it's like being around the Son of God. When He wipes those tears from your eyes. That all the pain and suffering, all the disappointments that you have faced. He wipes away. In verse 5 He says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. 
God shall help her and that right early. You see, don't change your mind concerning who God is. People who have lost the will of fight, they have forgotten who God really is. They have forgotten. Don't forget who God really is. Don't forget that He created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. He just breathed it out of nothing. Don't forget that He did that. Don't forget that even though the Almighty did all those things and made mankind and mankind failed when He shouldn't have failed, there was no excuse for Adam and Eve. They failed. But God, through His infinite knowledge and sovereignty, He said, before I created all those things, I had the plan set in place that God would become flesh and dwell amongst them and die for their sins on a cruel cross. And that He would rise again the third day. You see, you were not an afterthought. Your sin wasn't even an afterthought with God. He saw it coming and He said, I'm going to see it coming and I have redemption's plan not later. It's not plan B. It's plan A. That's how much Almighty God cares about you. When you get to John chapter 3, it reads like this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was not an afterthought. It was a forethought. All the things that you're going through, God saw them coming. God saw them coming. And, you're, and you may be thinking, well, 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 Brother Mitch, if God saw it coming, why does He let me go through this? Why are you living in the spirit of fear? Why can't you trust His strength? Obviously, God wants to grow you in His power and His love. You see, we forget something sometimes. You're like, but I got faith, Brother Mitch. Listen, if your faith cannot be tested, it cannot be trusted. God is going to put you through things. He is trying to hone you. He's trying to make you sharper. He's trying to make you better. Are you better than Job? Who went through all those things? Are you better than Moses? Are you better than Abraham? Are you better than Lot? Are you better than Isaac and Jacob? And, uh, and Elijah? Are you better than Elijah? We get in this pity party for ourselves and we forget that God is our strength. He is our refuge. <clears throat> Don't let anything in this world change your mind. Don't let it change your mind. Don't let it mess with you. It is lies that's coming after you. Don't be moved. God is in your midst. That verse that I've been kind of quoting to you, Romans 8, verse 18. If you're going through something this morning, you need to write this verse down. You need to memorize it. It says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. You know what that means? Whatever it is that you're going through today, don't think that it can even compare with the glory that's coming. It just can't. It just can't. And this is the Apostle Paul. Should I rehearse to you what was going on with the Apostle Paul? The Scripture says he has a thorn in his flesh that wouldn't leave him. He had been stoned a couple of times. One time left for dead. And God let him come back. He'd been shipwrecked several times. He had been rejected by all his friends and his family. All those that thought Paul Saul was so great went before he was Paul, 
They wanted to kill him by the time that you get to the middle of the book of Acts, don't they? They had grown up with him. But all of a sudden, when Jesus takes precedence in his life, they have no need for, for him anymore. And they seek to kill him themselves. And that's exactly what this world does. When you, and I've seen, and you know what, and this is, and it, and it makes me sad sometimes. Because I see, I see people that they, that they get a hold of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they start growing in grace and in faith. And all of a sudden the devil comes at them. Bam! Left and right. Just beating them up. They start feeling like Benjamin and Jabesh Gilead. And they're like, I just don't know if I've got any more fight in me. That's what the world wants you to feel like. Listen to this verse in verse 6. It says, The heathen rage, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The kingdoms of this world, they're governed by the devil himself. Why not? Why not if you're claiming the name of Christ that the Satan come after you? That's what he does. You should count it as glory when Satan starts messing with you. But don't give in to him. Don't let him win. Stand strong. Don't lose that will to fight. Roll up your sleeves. Muster the power of God. Pray some prayers like the Apostle Paul would, would do. He said that I may know him. When you know God, he will, he will give you more energy inside of you. That I may know Him and the fellowship of His suffering and His power. That I may know Him and His power of His resurrection. God raises that, that word power. It's like dynamite. It just explodes in you. Well, there's something else that explodes like dynamite. Anybody ever, ever seen Old Faithful or seen videos of it? Oh my goodness. A powerful thing that comes up and shoots 300 feet in the air. It's amazing. Remember, uh, not too long ago, Yellowstone had this, this water eruption that happened in one of their facilities. It blew the thing up. Imagine God's power within you. What kind of, what kind of force can stand against God's power that's actually in you? It's not the spirit of fear, it's the spirit of God. The enemies of this world will rage against you. You can guarantee it. Mark it down. That when you start doing it, you're like, man, I, I, I'm loving this serving God thing. Maybe you've had a couple of victories. I, I tell you what, victories is what scares me the most. You know that? When I see victories in my life or other people's lives, then I know that's the sign Satan's about to launch an all-out war against me. That's what he does. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. And it doesn't matter who you are, you are not exempt from satanic attack. Because he just realizes, I have lost you. So now I'm going to mess with you. I want to ruin your testimony. I want to bring you down and make you worthless for the kingdom of God. That's what he wants. And he rages the kingdoms of this world who are angry and they fight against God. And they know they can't win against God, but they, so they attack you and they want to win against you. God is your refuge. He is your strength. Verse 7. One of those things that I tell you to remember. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That, that verse, that, that thought keeps coming up. God is our refuge. It says first though that He's the God of hosts. Do you know what that means? He is the God of the armies of heaven. Do you know how many are up there? The best that we can come up with from the scriptures is that one third of the angels in heaven were taken by, by Satan. That's the, that's the number that some people can come up with. Well, maybe he did take one third, 
That means two thirds are there still. There's a story in the scripture where I think it's Elisha and his servant and the king of Syria has come against him. And he wants to um, and the, the king of Syria wants to put a stop to Elijah. Man, Elijah keeps costing him battles, keeps costing him troops. And he's like, I'm going to deal with Elijah I'm, or Elisha. I'm going to take him out. So we start sending off armies of 50s at a time. And God keeps and Elisha steps out. He's like, if I be a man of God, I think I can, I'm getting the story mixed up. That does happen, too. God takes out those armies. But the servant, he looks around and he's like, this is terrifying. How can me and Elijah stand against these? And Elisha turns to him and says, God, open up his eyes so he can see. And the eyes of the servant are opened up and he looks into the hills. And he sees the hills are full of God's armies. These giant angelic creatures. Ready to pounce down on God's enemies at God's word. Do you realize in this world, you are not alone in whatever fight that you want to fight unless you want to fight it alone. I guess it's kind of cliche, but the best battles that you'll ever win will be fought on your knees. When you realize God is your refuge, He is your strength, and He has all these armies. As a, as a scripture that I've already quoted. If God is for you. Who can be against you? Who can stand against God Almighty? Who can stand against His armies? When you get to the book of Revelation. Satan and the beast are all cast into the lake of fire. If they are cast into the lake of fire. And they are fighting against God. But they... They lose horribly. It doesn't even look like there's a fight. They're just picked up and chunked. If he's on your side, do you think the enemies in, of yours, the things that are bringing, bringing you down, that, are, that seem to be conquering you today, do you think that they really have any chance against God? Only if you dwell on those things. Look at verse 8. It says, Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations He hath made in the earth. You know, one of the things that we need to recognize is that just as much as God cared about you and me and Israel and Benjamin and uh, Jabesh Gilead, God looks at our generation coming up. Man, our kids need some help. In fact, when you start looking at anybody under 60, I think these days, most of those guys do not know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They have been fed the lies of the devil. He has taken over all the systems of, this, of, our, of our nation and have programmed people to be contrary against God Almighty. So when you start looking at all these things going on, even what's going on in your life, God is at, I think it's God actually working to try to reach the next generations. What would you go through to reach somebody who doesn't know Jesus? What would you go through? Would you go through some of the things that you're going through now? I hope that you would say, it'd be worth it. I would go through ten times this much. Because when I start looking around, I start... You know, we start, we're starting to see diseases more, cancers more, all kinds of weird stuff, right? God is trying to get our young, younger people's attention. He's trying. He's trying. They have gotten their focus off of God. They have gotten their focus on the things of this world. And God is trying to reach them. And unfortunately... It seems like that the only way to reach people most of the time is through heartache and pain and trauma. I wish it were not that way. You know, I've had several kids in my house, haven't I? How many times I've tried to communicate with them, don't do this. 
They won't listen. It's not until you bring out something with a little bit more reinforcement that they will start paying attention. I'm like, why can't you just, why can't you just accept my word that I love you and I actually am making good decisions for you? Oh, no, that's not good enough. I've got to figure it out for myself. God has given us a word that says that he loves you. You don't have to figure it out all by yourself. You can just trust his word. But we won't. And there's a reason. Our focus is on the world. Our focus is on the fear. God has a plan to fix everything. The things that we're seeing, the things that we are experiencing, and, and you know what? It is hard. Y'all think, well, Brother Mitch, you must be the best person here. I'm telling you, the reason I know this is because I'm not. It's hard. It's hard to keep your mind on the right path. It's hard not to give up. It's hard to not lose the fight inside of you or that will to fight. It would be much easier to just say, you know what? I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. God, you need somebody else. And you know what he'll say? There is nobody else. You're the guy. Saul, you're the guy. You know, the scripture tells us so often that God is searching for that one person. Is there one who would stand in the gap? Is there one who would not give in to the fear of, of the flesh? Is there one who would say, it doesn't matter what I have to go through, it's worth it. And how many times God says, I couldn't even find one. I couldn't even find one. What do you do? You start looking for that blessed hope. How do you be that one? You recognize God does have a fix. And that we are called to be faithful. We are called to endure. We are called to keep on keeping on. Even though the world is falling out, falling apart around us, we just keep going until God takes us home. Because we understand this. God has a fix. Verse, uh, verse 9, 10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I'm sorry, verse 9. And he maketh wars to cease unto the ends of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear. In sunder, he burneth the chariot in the fire. God has a plan to fix everything. We have to keep our eyes on, the, on Jesus Christ. He is the biggest part of that plan. He is the, he's the fix. You keep your eyes on Jesus. And just, like, and just like Peter when he's walking on the water... He's doing fine as long as he keeps his eyes on Jesus. But when he looks around at the waves and the wind, that's when he sinks. That's when he fails. You keep your eyes on the fix, on the plan, on Jesus Christ. We're looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we got to do. We've got to keep our mind and our focus on that. Look at verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. You know, there's many times that we feel like there, there's nothing that we can do. What do you do? You wait on God. You wait on God. He is your ultimate rest. Remember the scripture? In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I get it. I understand. This life is hard. It's not meant to be easy. And I think God wants it to be a little bit difficult for us so that we don't just get caught up in this world and think, Oh, I just want to stay here forever. As a believer, you should be, you should be if, if Jesus sit down he's, and say, who's ready to come home? All your hands should go up. Like, it doesn't matter. Man, I'm ready. I've already been through enough. 
If this is the way, if that, if that's, if you're offering to go back to heaven right now, count me in. Verse eleven. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord is with you. He is not forsaking you. He has not abandoned you. You may think, man, I just don't, I just haven't been feeling God lately. Benjamin and Jabesh Gilead were not feeling God lately. But God had already planned. He already had the cure. He already had the fix. It was in place. All he needed was for that guy to stand up. And he did. He did because he was full of the Spirit of God. He did because he understood some things. And that's where we need to be. Isaac, if you'll come on up. I want to rehearse a one more verse for you. Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 27. The eternal God is our refuge. Do you get that? The eternal God. That means that He has no end. No beginning. No end. He is eternal. And He's our refuge. We're stuck in this world. But one day we're going to be in that re re we He's watching over us. He cares what's going on. And underneath are everlasting arms. And He shall thrust out the enemy from before thee. And shall say, destroy them. You know what? I know you have an enemy. I know you've got a bunch of enemies. The older you get, it, the more enemies that you inherit, it seems like, right? Enemies of pain and suffering. Disappointment. Deceit. Your body starts turning against you, right? Even your body says, nope, I'm against you now. Let me see how many problems I can give you. The eternal God is our refuge. He's going to take care of us. He's even got a new body waiting for you. And underneath are His everlasting arms. He just wants to pick you up. He wants to hold you. Will you let Him? And He shall thrust out the enemy from before thee. That's what God wants to do. So don't get so caught up in the things of this world. Remember, there is a fountain. There is a fountain. And it comes from that river of life. Isaac and I are going to do a song here in just a second called uh, There is a River. While we're doing that song, if y'all would just stand and just pray. If anybody feels led to come up and pray on your own, you may. If you see somebody come up and pray, would you, would you come up and pray with them?